call the meeting to order at six o'clock. First on the agenda, are there any changes or additions, Dan? None. Okay, hearing none. We'll move to approving the minutes. Uh, approve the minutes of March 1st, 2021. So moved. I have second. a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor by roll call. Gary? Aye. Eric? Aye. Judy? Aye. Brian? Aye. And the motion is passed unanimously. Next, we have board reorganization. I'm going to turn the meeting over to Brian Kellogg, who is our current vice chair. Go ahead, Brian. Okay, I'd like to open the floor to anybody that wants to be chair. I nominate Bob Beeman for chair. I'll second it. Anybody else? All in favor say aye. 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 Aye for Brian. I, it passed. I'll turn the meeting back over to Bob. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Bob, Brian. All right, number two, elect vice chair. Do I hear any motions for vice chair? I'd like to make a motion for Gary Nolan. Okay, I have a motion for Gary. Is there a second? I have a second by Eric. Is there any further discussion? All in favor by roll call? Eric? Aye. Judy? Aye. Brian? Aye. Gary? You accept that position? Sure. Okay, and it's unanimous. Motion is passed. Gary is our new vice chair. Next, uh, appoint department liaisons which we have a list of our current liaisons right now. Uh, it's in our packet. <clears throat> we have Brian Kellogg for the fire department, Bob Beeman for the police department, Judy Bickford for rescue, Eric Dodge for highway, and Gary Nolan as general government. Um, how do you want to do this? Is everybody happy doing what they're doing or does anyone have any discussion about making a change? And Bob? This is Brian. I'd like to stay where I am. Okay. How about you, Judy? I'm happy where I am. The bill runs such a smooth um, organization that I haven't been challenged to do a whole lot. That's why I stay with uh, the chief. It makes it easy for us. How about you, Eric? I'm good with the highway. Highway. Right. And Gary? Good. Good. Don't have any choice, I guess. <laughs> so, so do we want to uh, make a motion for these as they're presented here in the memo? Yeah, that, that's, yeah. Okay. So, I move that we uh, accept the liaison assignments as posted in our bulletin, and just discuss by you. Okay. I have a motion. Is there a second? Brian. Is that you? Okay. Um, all in favor by roll call, Gary? Aye. Eric? Aye. Brian? Aye. Judy? Aye. And I'm aye as well. It's unanimous. Motion is passed. All right, next we have uh, set the regular meeting schedule. Uh, does anybody have any comment or discussion about the way we have our meeting? Just right now, the, the current meetings, regular meetings, schedule, um, of every month at 6 p.m. Nope. Works good for me. Works good for you. How about you, Judy? Oh, uh, uh, there was some interference there. It's still the first and third Monday at 6. Is that correct? That's correct. That sounds good to me. Yeah. How about you, Brian? Well, actually, it's every other Monday, right? Even some Mondays it might be more. It's first and third. We've been doing first and third Mondays now for, for quite a uh, while. For about a year and a half, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> all right with that. You're all right. And I am too. Do we want a motion for that? I guess. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to motion that we accept the schedule as our schedule going forward for third. Of every month, it's six years. Okay, I have a motion from Eric. Do I have a second? 
Second. Second by Gary. Is there any further discussion on this? I don't know if you want the minutes to reflect that sometimes we have special meetings because of elections. In my world, honey. Or for other reasons. Yeah, I mean, this, this is just your this is just your regular meeting. Just a regular meeting schedule. Uh, special meetings can be warned as necessary. Okay. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. But Judy. All in favor, say aye by roll call. Gary. Aye. Eric. Aye. Judy. Aye. Brian. Aye. And I'm aye as well. Vote is unanimous. Motion is passed. We will, we will be meeting every first and third Monday at 6 p.m. Next, community concerns. Do we have any community concerns here or by video? Bob, this is uh, Don McDowell. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, I can. Go ahead, sir. Hey, Bob. Um, I, I guess I'll start just by uh, congratulating you and Brian on your reelection. Um, and thanks to the board for all their hard work over doing all the things that they, they, uh, they are tasked to do. Thank you. Um, it's, we've had a couple of select board meetings in the past where um, ATV use on the roads has come up and I know you as a board uh, meant to wait until the town wait until the town meeting and the budget were, were done. So now that that's behind us, I guess I'd, I guess I'd like to revisit that conversation a little bit. Um, we have right now um, a petition with over 355 signatures, 326 of which are from Morristown. So about 91% of those people are Morristown residents that are looking to have a, a public discussion, an informational meeting. And I know my wife and I talked to Brian before town meeting and Bob, I know you've put some stuff on front porch forum and elsewhere talking about the need for an informational meeting as well. And I'd just like to get that discussion out there. Uh, I guess a couple of things, the, there's a, a when and where issue to this. Um, the when is probably more in the governor's uh, hands right now on, on, on when we might be able to meet, but the venue and the place and, and how this might be organized is clearly in the, in the board's uh, jurisdiction. And just hoping that we can have a place where Morrisville residents can come and attend and express their concerns one way or the other on on the issue of ATVs on on uh, on roads around town so just kind of wondering where the board stands on on that issue yeah um that, that's good for you to bring it up um it was something i was planning on uh mentioning tonight in my select board concerns um having talked to the rest of my board um actually at length um we've decided that we're going to wait until uh, the governor relieves the restrictions on public gatherings because uh, we realize it's a really important topic and there's a lot of people in town that that have their opinions they want to voice them and we certainly want that we welcome um, a due process with this thing and um, we know there's two sides and maybe maybe more than two sides and we certainly need to um, set up a, a venue that can accommodate that um, and that may be more so BSW or perhaps a high school gym or something like that. It's going to be a lot bigger than um, we could certainly house here in the town meeting room or even the extended room we have. So I think our cue right now is to wait for the governor to release, relieve some of the restrictions on public gatherings. And we've been tuned into that where I listen to every single one he does. And um, it's definitely not there yet, but I think it is going to come pretty soon. Um, it sounds to me like it might be even as soon as May, but um, we don't, it's too early to tell, you know, I can't, um, quoting him, you know, when he's going to um, turn the spigot enough so we can meet in public. Uh, but certainly we want to invite anybody from the public that wants to voice their opinions about it. We totally know how important it is to a lot of people and on both sides of it, like you said. And um, so that's what we're just waiting for. And Meanwhile, um, if you want to make sure that your opinion is heard, you can um, call our office at 5147-888-5147 and talk to Dan Lindley. Um, he, he can um, get your email address, make sure you're emailed prior to it. We're also going to put out a lot of uh, notices on, you know, probably 
lots of places, the paper, our agenda, um, just keep looking out for that. And we'll post it plenty of time so anybody out there uh, will be able to attend. So um, I don't know if, you got, if any of the board has any comments to go with that or not. I would like to I would like to ask for some information. I know that I've seen the front porch forum post. This is Judy Bickford, and people have been saying, um, you know, research or data, and I'd really like to see that, um, not just someone quoting it, but to, just to get a, a, you know, send that to us in an email or a, a link to it. That would be helpful. That, that's a good point, Judy. Thank you. Is there any other comments from anybody listening or anybody here? Uh, just thank you very much for uh, agreeing to an informational meeting and a public discussion. I think it is. I think it is going to be very important, and um, it's a, a good time for Morrisville residents, in particular, to to discuss this discuss this Morristown issue. And um, hopefully, at that time, we can get a lot of information out about what uh, what what you know we might be seeing in our future here right yeah thanks a lot for your comments and for the input we'll keep everybody posted okay thank you very much yeah. and well, well, i just want to add this gary nolan and i just want to add that it may make a difference if and when we receive a proposal to open any roads uh to date all there's been is a question whether we will or whether we won't there's been no proposal as to which roads that they're looking to open or or not so that may have a bearing on when we have a meeting so at this point i take that to mean that at this point the select board has not received any proposals on what roads to open we actually do have i received one by personal email but um it's not it's not uh, an official one, so it'll be coming, I'm sure, but we haven't. Okay, thank you. Is there any other community concerns or comments? Yeah, this is Kevin Lane. I, I have a concern about the, the, the timing of a meeting. Uh, I, I assume we want to do this in person and with the the rate at which people are being vaccinated, I think it's it's uh, going to be a long time before people are who are interested in participating in this conversation uh, feel comfortable going into a room with hundreds of other people. That's a good point, but that's why I said we're going to wait till um, you know the restrictions are relieved so we can all meet. So and it could mean a month, it could mean six months. But we're not going to rush into it. Uh, that's been uh, our goal right along: is make sure this whole thing has due process and everybody gets a chance to chime in. And I, I think also to add, Bob, that, that no one on the select board has made a decision. That's true. We, ha we haven't made a decision about this. That's a good point, Judy. Is there any other comments? Okay, we'll move on. Next is the liquor control. Was an updated one that I put on the desk for everybody to look at. Take a motion then of liquor control board. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. All in favor by roll call. Gary? Aye. Eric? Aye. Judy? Hi. Brian. Hi. Hear me? <laughs> we are now in the Board of Liquor Control. So there yeah. are uh, four renewals, Mountain View Campground, Hoagies, the Charlemont, and El Toro. Okay, Richard, have you had a chance to look at any of these or any? We just, we just looked at no issues. No issues? Okay. Do I hear a motion regarding them? I make a motion that we approve all four establishments' requests for a renewal. All right, I have a motion and a second by Judy. Is there any further discussion? I have a question because on my phone I couldn't tell for sure, but I think the Charlemont and El Toro both want outside consumption. That is correct. Yes. Okay. So, 
That's it. And you knew, you guys knew that as well. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. All in favor say aye by roll call. Gary? Aye. Eric? Aye. Judy? Aye. Brian? Aye. I'm aye as well. Vote is unanimous. Motion is passed. Make a motion to come out of the Liquor Control Board. I have a motion to come out. Is there a second? Second. Second, <laughs> second by Gary. He beat you this time, Judy. All in favor say aye. Gary? Aye. Eric? Aye. Judy? Aye. Brian? Aye. We are now out of liquor control, back in the regular select board meeting. So next on the agenda is new business. So we're going to discuss uh, Stafford Avenue traffic light. I guess it's a good time to discuss that. Yep. Um, Kevin, are you online? I am, Dan. Thank you. Kevin uh, Marshy with the agency of Vermont Agency of Transportation. Uh, just as a segue, Kevin was very instrumental in getting the, the truck route built. Um, so me and him worked a, a lot together on this project. So he's very familiar with the, the intersection and everything that was done <laughs> with the whole project. So Kevin has a short presentation and some discussion that he's going to go through um, and just where we're at and how to move forward, that kind of thing. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, welcome, Kevin. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us tonight. Uh, with me tonight is Ian DeGudis, who is our traffic uh, operations engineer, and Josh Kaler, who's a traffic an engineer in uh, Ian's group. Uh, my name, as Dan said, is Kevin Marshy. Uh, I manage our asset management bureau. Uh, and as Dan mentioned, I do have a long history, spent many years uh, working on the truck route, getting it through the design and permitting process and ultimately construction. So. Uh, it is good to be back uh, in, in Morrisville talking about things going on in the truck route. And obviously there's some concerns out there that we're, we're looking to address and we wanted to give the select board a, an update on that. Uh, we were contacted um, by MSI uh, regarding some concerns at the intersection of Stafford Avenue and the truck route. And what I'm gonna do, uh, I'm gonna have what we, what we do, one of the issues that we're looking at at the intersection is a traffic signal analysis. Uh, Ian and his team did that analysis. What I'd like to do is turn it over to Ian, if that's okay. And then um, Ian will go through the analysis, the results of that analysis. And then I'll just briefly step you through the process moving forward um, on what, what we would uh, be looking at at the intersection and the process to get potentially to a project uh, to address the issues at the intersection. So if it's okay, I'd like to turn it over to Ian. Sounds good, Ian. Uh, sounds good, Kevin. Welcome, Ian. Thanks. Um, yeah, so it, it's, as Kevin said, we were contacted by NSI. Uh, we had a meeting, some discussion, and we one of the topics that was raised was was whether a traffic signal was was an appropriate solution for this location. So we we conducted a what's called a signal warrant analysis, which is based out of the Federal Highways Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, and it's a primarily volumetric assessment of in, in plain terms, I guess I'd say whether whether a signal would cause the intersection to operate better than an unsignalized condition. It's not a, a comprehensive analysis of every condition. It's just a, a volumetric, how many cars there are on each approach, how long they have to wait, that, that type of thing. Um, so in order to do that, obviously we needed some traffic counts. We conducted a, a 12 hour manual count, which is quite standard for this. Um, in early December, I believe it was December 3rd, which is then adjusted using standard factors for for seasonal adjustments and such um put that in into the the warrant analysis uh josh actually did that calculation for us here um and the, the warrants that were met were the eight hour vehicular volume the four hour vehicular volume and the peak hour which is a reasonably strong warrant um you know, the eight, eight hour vehicular volume is is not often met in vermont um so at, at that point we can say that a traffic signal is warranted however being warranted in this case is like i said a, a volumetric metric of the um of, of how it would operate and does not take into account any of the considerations for the specific intersection um so that's kind of your your first step not your last step uh that the name is the name makes it sound a little more final than it is we, we went on, conducted a, a crash analysis uh, of the location, um, found that there had been, I believe, 10 crashes in the 
2018 to 2020 period, so 10 crashes in three years um, near the intersection. It, it can be a little bit tricky to, to know if they were precisely added or a very short distance away sometimes, depending on how they're coded. Um, and, and so it, based on using those crashes, we, we conducted some, some additional analysis showing that a traffic signal may improve safety um, if it can be constructed for a reasonable cost. But again, this is sort of the, the preliminary stage, not the final stage, um, but it, it, it does sort of point to a traffic signal could be a viable alternative at this location. Um, and with that, I guess I'll turn it back to Kevin to explain how we move on from here. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Ian. Um, but before we move on, um, are, are there any questions for Ian kind of on the technical side of things? And then what I would do is I would uh, I'll update the, the folks present in the board on the steps in terms of looking at this as a project. And I will say, um, I do want to acknowledge, I see Beth Selvis here. We haven't met in person, but we've communicated. Um, she's been sending us a lot of information to include um, an interesting and, and scary video today of a crash that occurred at the intersection. So thank you, Beth, for sending that along. So our numbers now are 11 crashes at the intersection, I guess, Ian. So are there any questions for Ian before we, we move on? Yeah, I, uh, this is Eric Dodge. Uh, I do it. What is at or near as far as a distance from the intersection? What is, what is that defined as? Um, I can look into that. It's. I, I think it was within maybe 150 or 200 feet of the intersection. And, and the reason that's a little bit unclear, and I, I apologize for, for not having a, a, a perfect answer to that, is that it, it's, it just depends on how the, uh, how the crashes get put into our, our crash reporting system, how the officer re records them. I, I believe in this case, and I apologize, I don't have all the details right in front of me on, on that. Um, but I believe in this case there was one crash that was maybe 150 to 200 feet away from the intersection. But on reviewing the the crash report, we we sort of felt that it was not related to the intersection. Um, I, I I don't recall the details, and and so the so it's it gets a little bit. There was one or two in there that we we weren't sure were truly related to this intersection, but because they happened within, you know, say say within a football field of the intersection, we consider them in the analysis. Um, and I, I, I don't have the, uh, the entire report right in front of me to, to get deeper than that. Is that, it? Is that your question? I guess so. I just know that a football field distance from that intersection puts you into the Hannaford's parking lot pretty much. And you could have a parking lot crash, but I'm not sure how much analysis you did on the report itself. Yeah, uh, these, these, were, the these were all, Go ahead, sorry. No, I, and I thought the officers, when they did the crash reports, they uh, inserted GPS coordinates on the reports. Wouldn't that pinpoint where the location is? Yes. Um, and, and so these, these were all on the truck route. Um, so, so yes, it, it's, it, it's on the truck route. And I, I there, 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 and I, I, there's one, I think, that, as I said, it appeared to be a short distance down the truck route and unrelated to the intersection, but otherwise, at least the nine of them were on on the truck route and in the vicinity of the intersection, in the intersection for, for practical purposes. Thank you. Yeah. I also want to point out that we also have um, Richard Keith and Jason Luno here tonight from the Morristown Police Department. If there's any questions or comments, for them or from them. They're here. Sometimes you can't tell who's in the room here with us. But we also have Bill Mates, who's our rescue chief. So if anybody has any comments or questions for, for them, they can do that as well. And, and certainly we, uh, when, when we're working with law enforcement, especially local law enforcement, they have a, a better sense a lot of times of those crashes at the intersections than we do because they're the ones obviously responding to the crashes and writing those reports. Uh, sometimes it is state police, but so uh, certainly we'd welcome any input that they have as well. So if there are not 
Uh, more questions in terms of the, the technical side of things, uh, just briefly the, the process that we would have moving forward. So uh, as you might imagine around the state, we have lots of locations where there's crashes, uh, certainly uh, lots of locations where there are concerns, community concerns, business concerns, and so forth. What we do um, on an annual basis is we take information in, um, usually through regional planning commissions, uh, but also through, you know, communities and, and, and individual uh, motorists as well. We, we do these analysis and, you know, it's, it's, I'm sure the same in Morrisville as it is for us. Um, you know, there just always isn't enough funding to go around and fix everything. So what we do, we actually uh, have initiated a, a new process, um, a very comprehensive process to prioritize our projects. And actually just, uh, let's see, about a week and a half ago, we sent a list out to each regional planning commission around the state with a list of potential projects. And so what we do is we take the available money and in, in the various programs we have, roadway, traffic, pavement, bridge, different areas. We take the, in those programs, the available funding that we have uh, based on revenue projections. Uh, and then we look at the amount of projects, the number of projects we already have committed that are in our capital program. And we look at what I'll call the out years, those years uh, beyond, you know, obviously for this summer and next summer, and, and in some cases even beyond, we have projects planned and the and the uh, the plate is full, if you will. Uh, so our process is we look at the potential projects at, in the various regions around the state, and we send them to the regional planning commissions, and we're ranking them uh, based on eight criteria: um, asset condition, safety, mobility and connectivity, and here both mobility and connectivity at an intersection. Um, you both have delay. Um, and, and you also have kind of the connectivity. I know there's pedestrian concerns here at this intersection. Economic access, resiliency, uh, health access in terms of the ability of, for a project to be within not just the area of a local uh, health facility, but also recreation and other things, uh, and regional priority. So those are the criteria that we rank. We work with the regional planning commissions and we rank our projects based on that. So what we've, what we've done is right now, uh, the Lamont County, uh, excuse me, Lamont County Planning Commission has a list of potential projects. This intersection is one of them, and we we've provided them some information. And between now and the end of May, they will be um, filling out and completing the scoring of the criteria that I mentioned. V Trans has done some. The regions will be doing others. And at the end of that, at the end of that process, uh, around around June first, we'll be receiving from Lamont County and all of the regions around the state. Uh, the the listing, the, the value of all eight of those scores is what we refer to as the transportation value. So we'll be taking that in statewide and we'll be looking at the list of projects that are out there. Uh, we've provided them a list of what we feel are projects, but we've also provided the regional planning commissions the opportunity to submit regionally driven projects in case there's something that VTrans may have missed. So they will be sending that to us uh, around June 1st. We then take all of that information and put it together and put a, you know, put a lot of considerations, uh, safety, regional, um, the regional issues, community support, obviously the, the financial resources that we have is a big driver. And we then, uh, we, we pair that list down because our potential projects, the list that we have is greater than our financial capacity because we want to give the opportunity for um, regions and communities to look at you know, different projects and rank them so that we can look at the scores. So what we do is then we then throughout the uh, summer and fall, we'll take a look at that and we'll come up with the list of projects that we'll be re recommending to the legislature in the governor's draft recommended budget. Uh, we finalized that late December to early January. And so if this intersection was one that we, you know, that, that made the cut, if you will, in terms of the funding availability, it would go into the governor's recommended budget that the that the legislature uh, goes through, which they're going through right now our current year. If it is approved, which normally it is through the the legislative process, usually we have uh, much support in, in, from um, the legislative committees that we work with. That then it would become an official VTrans project. Um, we would program it, and the project would then go through a project development timeline, typically with traffic signals. It's you know and and. And in this situation, knowing, um, you know, knowing the project and knowing the intersection like I do, I know that the, we have the right way and there's not a lot of environmental permits that would likely be needed. As long as there's community support, it would be approximately two to four years before we, we would have um, a traffic signal constructed at this intersection.
So there's a lot of considerations that are still out there. Meeting the traffic signal warrants is the first step. We will then go through the prioritization this summer, working with the Regional Planning Commission. If this does rise uh, to the point of becoming a project two to four years from now, uh, you'll be able to expect a traffic signal installed at this location. It's, uh, I, I have a comment and um, not just from me, but a lot of people that contacted me because I'm on the select board is, uh, you know, it sounds like a lot of red tape. <laughs> it sounds like I see tons of close calls out there and I have lots of people contact me about how dangerous it is there and depending on what time it is, of course. And in, in years past, I remember back when they first put a traffic signal up at uh, the old Grand Union and Hannaford, you know, the, the other intersection there. And, and before it, it went in, there was comments from the people, well, somebody has to be either lose their life or be, have serious physical harm before they'll do it. And I never, never believed that to be true. And, and I also hate the idea that it has to do with money. You know, and, and a few of your references, you were talking about if the funding is there and money, but you can't put a price tag on, you know, serious physical harm or, you know, loss of life or something like that. And, and I get, I get, it's very common for me to get contacted about it. And of course, it's a state highway there, the bypass, and, and I can't do a lot about it, but I can voice the opinions that I hear from people that um, this thing should be put on the fast track, if you will. And, you know, here, two to four years sounds like a long time. And I know I, I kind of avoid that intersection. I, I usually drive it once a day, only because I do it at 3.30 in the morning when there's nobody there. When I leave work, I never go that way because there's so much traffic and it can be very dangerous. So that's, that's kind of my two cents and I just wanted to leave that, that with you for a comment. Understood and, and we certainly understand that concern and, and you know, when we do hear about these situations around the state, we also understand that, that urgency as well. I guess laying out that two to four year time frame, we want to be realistic. Uh, could it happen sooner? It, it may, um, but we want to also be make sure we're setting reasonable expectations on on the length of time it would take to develop a project. Is there will there be a walk light um, put in place too? So one of the considerations that would go into a traffic signal at this location would be uh, pedestrian facilities. Uh, my understanding, and I certainly don't want to speak for, for Beth or for MSI, is that they're considering um, sidewalks on that side of the intersection. I don't believe, I, I believe I, what I've read is that currently uh, the town does not have uh, considerations of putting uh, sidewalks or pedestrian facilities along Stafford Avenue. That could, I don't, you know, that's what I've read. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, however, pedestrian facilities and that coordination would be something that we would work with with the adjacent property owners and the town on uh, if we were to, if, as we went through the design of a project at the intersection. Could it be striped before you started? I'm sorry? Could it be striped for um, a crosswalk before the lights are put in? That's a good question. And Ian, I'll, I'll have you help me out a little bit here, but I, I would say that um, that is that is a concern. Um, certainly with the speeds out there, you know, one of the things that we look at when, you know, putting uh, a painted crosswalk on in there doesn't, it gives a pedestrian maybe a good sense of um, safety, but with the speeds and the volumes we have out there, I think we'd want to do more than just paint a crosswalk. Um, we may be setting some expectations and potentially creating a situation that was less safe. Uh, Ian, uh, you certainly have a better handle on the, the MUTCD piece. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, a, a fair assessment, Kevin, that um, given given some of the concerns that have been raised about, about this intersection that simply striping a crosswalk would not necessarily be an, a, an appropriate and safe condition. Um, it, it be, being that it's a limited access roadway, it would also require formal approval from the traffic committee to allow that to be installed, um, which again, it's, it's, it's just a matter of making sure that, that we're doing something that is safe um, to, to get that approval. And, and further, at, at present with no formal pedestrian facilities on either side of the intersection. Um, we, we as an agency don't construct crosswalks that, that don't terminate in accessible pedestrian features to ensure that we're not, again, driving people or, or guiding people into unsafe conditions or, or conditions that, that may be 
um, challenging to, to navigate for, for those with, with different abilities, um, you know, sidewalks, safe curb ramps, et cetera. Gary, Gary Nolan has Thank a question you. for you. Hey, Kevin, Gary Nolan. Hi, Gary, how are you? I'm doing well. I thought probably you'd retired by now. No, no, I got. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there or is there not infrastructure in place there for a traffic signal? I don't, uh, you know, that, that's a that's a very good question and something that I'll look into. I don't believe that we put conduits uh, in when we built the truck route, but certainly something that I could look into. That's a, that's a good question. Yeah, I'm, I don't want to go against what you think, but I'm pretty sure there's hand holes and stuff on either side or all four corners the, of that intersection for conduit. There, there may be, uh, Gary. That's something that we'll definitely look into because obviously, if there are, that would uh, make the construction even, even that much uh, smoother, I guess, if you will. So, uh, well, so good might, question. Might something we'll up, look into. Yeah, it might speed up the two to four year process a little if infrastructure is already in. Yeah. yeah the, the other question yeah, I, I had was, uh, what is the cost of a of a full traffic signal with lights with uh, cameras? Um, do you have an idea what that is? Of course, that depends on what Gary said, if the infrastructure is already put in ahead of time. But just give us a ballpark of what, what something like costs now. I know it used to be like $50,000, but it's probably 10 times that now. Well, I, I think you might have, I think you might have just made a pretty good guess. Um, <laughs> you know, I think, and, and I've actually seen some information out there that, you know, maybe 250,000, that may have even come from the, from somebody in the agency. I will tell you with traffic control at the location there with the traffic volumes um, and, and certainly, you know, the distance because of the turn lanes, I, I gotta believe it would be somewhere uh, certainly north of half a million dollars and maybe more. Thank you. And uh, anything to add on that, Ian? No, I, I, I think that that's probably, again, a, a realistic number and, and that it, it could come in potentially if, if there's some infrastructure in place a, a bit lower than that. But I think from a realistic perspective, um, half a million or a bit above would be a, a good guess. Thank you. I, this is Eric Gondi. I'd be interested, the, the volume of the, uh, the flow down through there would... Uh, in my mind, be almost identical at the Bridge Street intersection where there is a light. I'd be interested if the same study was conducted at that intersection, if in fact that light would prove out to have uh, created a safer intersection. Even though it's not completely apples to apples, uh, the, the Stafford Avenue intersection is wider, uh, but they both have left turn lanes. They're very similar in design, just not uh, perhaps the same dimensions. I, I can tell you that my concerns are coming from the fact that it is so close to the traffic circle. And as well as the circle has, has worked, and that's an opinion, because I don't drive eastbound on Route 15 in the morning, some may argue my point, but uh, the traffic light at that intersection would further cause backups and delays in the circle. Uh, so I'm just, I wanna make sure that if this is, once it's in, it's in. There's no taking it back typically, but I, I just wanna make sure we've looked at all avenues here before we make the final decision uh, to ensure that we're not creating hazards north and south of that intersection by installing a light. I, I would say that, that that's an excellent point and something that we would look at in the design phase to make sure that the, the timing of the signal and, and so forth, uh, because it, uh, you're absolutely right, it is close to uh, the roundabout and we want to make sure that that works. And and I guess I would say, I, I think, you, you know, your comment about the uh, signal at Bridge Street, that was something that was part of the original design of the truck route. And, and really the reason for that was we knew the volumes. Um, that was an existing street. Um, and, and while there was existing facilities, um, you, you know, at Stafford Avenue, the traffic patterns changed. Um, you know, you folks know that better than I do, but quite a bit change. I think we're actually seeing um, higher volumes on the truck route than what we actually anticipated as well. So while we recognize that there may be the need for, for future work at this intersection, at the time of, uh, at the time that we designed it and what we knew in, in estimating what those traffic volumes and growth would be, um, it wasn't warranted at that time. 
So Richard to Keith your, has to your a point, comment. absolutely. We got a comment from uh, Chief of Police here, Richard Keith. I also would recommend that you check the intersection of Bishop Marshall because uh, it's been talking the officers as many crashes there now still as there has been Stafford have. So. And uh, the other point when you talk about near the intersection of crashes, I know one that was quite a bit down the road be, uh, south of there, that was a pedestrian crash. It was not really that intersection at all. So, so yeah. yeah. That, that's a good point and, and certainly we'd welcome the opportunity to, to talk with you more about the right. you know this intersection and also um the issues or concerns that you that you may be seeing at the bishop marshall intersection yeah. Yeah, thanks. thanks richard is there any other comments or do you have anything else to present that was it we just wanted to to update the board on on kind of where we are at with the traffic signal warrant out analysis and, and the steps forward so if there's nothing else thank you for having us tonight yeah i, we I want to join us i wanted to ask one more question um um and that's about the timing of the light is it um a light that'll be put in like in the evening at late at night when there's not a lot of traffic the it would go to a red blinking light or would that be the consideration putting it in there I, I can take that if you want, Kevin. Um, Please, uh, that That's something that, that it, if we got that far, would, would definitely be, be considered in the design phase. Um, and I, it's, it would be very premature for me to, to say what the timing to the signal might be. Um, but in, in general, our, our standard hours for, for flashing signals where, where it's appropriate to do so is 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. and I believe the other signals in Morrisville all flash from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Um, so that that would certainly be a, a possibility. We we generally don't don't change those hours, um, but but it is it it's, it would be a consideration at the at a later design phase. Thanks, Judy. Is there Thank any you. other comments? Um, Bob, Jim Mahoney, if I could for just a minute. How you doing, Jim? Good. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, so, uh, a couple of things. Uh, with, with due respect, I, I do think that we think that the, the crash numbers are somewhat underreported. Um, uh, secondly, you know, while MSI is the only one here tonight, um, this has become a more busy intersection for a lot of reasons and from a lot of users, um, especially truck related, it seems. Um, and, uh, you know, the only thing MSI is looking for is a, is a safe resolution here. Um, uh, and, you know, there's, I would make mention to the locomotion study that Morristown did a while back that was attached to some of the materials that, uh, that Kevin sent around earlier. There's some good information on this intersection there. Um, and then finally, you know, if the board feels the way you do, Bob, the way you can help us is to is to make it clear that that there is community support on this and that the feeling of the select board is that this should be, you know, among if not the top ranked priority in Morristown. Yeah, we haven't discussed it as a board, but I think I think we're all on the same page. I, I actually was going to talk about uh, the possibility of adding sidewalks. We're talking about new sidewalk areas, um, you know, in our uh, infrastructure paving and sidewalk costs for budget reasons. And I was going to suggest, uh, you know, the, the leg out to MSI and, and all that, you know, uh, all this has got to, got to start happening. I mean, we're not going to get smaller here, you know, uh, as to sidewalks, safe. as to sidewalks too, um, it was a condition of the conditional use permit that we got for the expansion that we bring it along Stafford. And that's just, that will happen this year that didn't happen last year because construction was finalizing and things got weird. Does anyone uh, on the select board want to chime in on, on their support or how you guys feel? I, I can't tell you that I would make a decision to support it or not support it because I don't think we have near enough information to make the decision. 
I think there's further study be made along the truck route. The chief has mentioned the Bishop Marshall intersection. I mentioned Bridge Street uh, mm -hmm. and the traffic circle. I, I think there are a lot of considerations here for for and against adding a traffic light at that intersection, and that perhaps there are other mitigating features that could be added other than traffic light in order to uh, to help that intersection if it's if it's deemed to be that dangerous a problem. Uh, I know the preliminary studies that they reported tonight would indicate that it, it does uh, meet the criteria at the state level, but um, I, I'm, I'm not convinced yet that that's the, the best choice for us. I, I, I'm just not convinced. I need more information. If I may, and I, I'm not sure if, Bob, may I chime in here for a second? Go ahead, Betty. Um, I just, I'm not sure if many of you know, we've had three employees hit by vehicles at that intersection. And October 29th of 2020, we had an, an employee injured so severely that she was at Copley Hospital for many weeks and moved from Copley Hospital to the manor. And Garrett and I sit right on the corner of Stafford Avenue and the bypass. So we have seen just about every accident that has happened there. And to see one of your employees flying through the air from someone coming from Stafford Avenue from Hannaford's and then hit right in front of your office and thinking, oh my goodness, I'm pretty sure that person is not gonna survive that accident. Um, I just, I'd really like to do something so that that intersection is safe for all 460 of our employees and everybody else who travels through that intersection. So that's, that's all I'm trying to accomplish. That's all Garrett and I are trying to accomplish at this meeting. And that's why we push so hard to get this traffic study done by VTrans. So Kevin, Ian, thank you so much for making that happen. Can I make a comment? Uh, is there any potential of managing it just by a little lower speed limit? And certainly you come out of the roundabout and you're just headed down this long straight hill and it, you know, it, it calls you to go. Um, is, is that an option at all? Can you identify yourself? Oh, it's Garrett Herchak. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> How are you? So is the speed limit change any uh, option possibly? I guess maybe how I'd respond to that is there's there's many options out there and just listening to the comments tonight, there may be some other uh, mitigations or countermeasures that we could s consider at the intersection. A, a speed limit change is certainly one of those tools in our tool bag. Um, I, I guess, I, you know, I, I would, with the volumes and the turning traffic um, and the issues and just watching the, the crash in the video today firsthand and watching it over and over again, I, you know, I, I would be skeptical that just changing the numbers on the speed limit sign would vastly improve safety at the intersection, but I wouldn't rule it out as a, as a consideration. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Gary, you, or Gary, you had a comment? No, not at this time, I guess. How about Judy or Brian? I'm all set. I, I agree with Eric. We ought to hear a lot more about it, I think. Um, definitely maybe do something if we can. And you, Judy? I, I, I'm interested in hearing more. I think that, uh, you know, I saw the video with the crash, listening to the statistics about people being hit. I wasn't aware of that, even though I read News and Citizen all the time. Um, and that's very concerning about we want the um, our town to be walkable, and um, people can ride their bikes. And I know I almost hit people on the the truck route at night sometimes when they're walking, and they're on the side of the road and you can't see them. So I do have a have a concern about safety there. Yeah, and I, I just want to reiterate my comment is if if I was to choose the most dangerous intersection in this town. It is that intersection, and um, I know all of them real well. And I don't think there's too many people that could deny that. That's why I'm 100% for it. 
and uh, either, like what Garrett said, reducing the speed there or the traffic signal, that's going to save lives or it's going to save serious physical harm. So I'm on board now. I understand and I respect uh, the rest of my board wanting to hear more information, but I'm sold on it right now. I'd, I'd like to see a traffic signal put up tomorrow. <laughs> so that's my two cents. And so if we could get some direction from you, not right this second, but at some point as to, you know, what, what additional information would you like us to try to put together? Um, you know, what, what, what you think the gaps are and how we might be able to address that. Additional studies. And that's an, that's an excellent point, you know, from, and, and I'm not familiar with the gentleman that just spoke, but um, you know, that's, you know, VTrans would also, you know, like to make sure that we understand if, if the, uh, if the board would be willing to put together, you know, any, a list of any concerns or additional information that you would like, um, we could, you know, that would be a, a good place for us to start as well. Sounds good. Is there any other comment? Any comments on law enforcement besides that? What do you guys feel like? Well, I will point out one thing that if they're saying there's three pedestrian crashes there, there's two we don't know about. Because you had one way down the road and you had one over on Brooklyn Street. They were uh, workers there, but not at that intersection with one. So, and she didn't yield the traffic whatsoever. Did you hear that, uh, Beth or Garrett? I just want to keep things accurate. Okay. I did. Yeah. Anyway, so I think just a, a closer look is a good idea. Um, you know, there is also a flow from the rail trail. They, there's kind of a, a, I guess, unpublicized access to the rail trail down at the end of Stafford Avenue. And you'll find that there's, quite a bit of human uh, activity on foot, on bicycle, that come up Stafford Ave, cross over into the Hennifer side of town there. And um, it's not just the people actually going to work uh, on Stafford Ave. There's a connection to the rail trail there that's, I would suggest, measurable. That's a good point, Garrett. Is there any other comments or input or questions? I want to thank everybody for joining us about this tonight, and um, we'll keep keep everybody posted going forward. Thank you for joining us, uh, Kevin and Ian. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. Go ahead. Did somebody have a comment? That's it. Bob, I just was curious. So, what the, what is the next step? Is it do we wait for VTrans or, is this, or do we have to do something? I think, Go ahead, Dan. I think it's VTrans will get back to us with more information. So it's really even, once again, you know, as Kevin has said, there's a process of, of it, where this ranks within the Regional Planning Commission as well. And then it's all about the available funding at that time, too. So no. it, it all break down to what the priorities are, both the regional and the state level. Right. Okay, that, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to number two, John Moger Copley parking lot. Um, John's on the line, but I'm not sure. Um, John, I know you can hear us. Um, I, I hear you if you can hear me. There you go. How you doing, John? Welcome. Thank you. How's everybody else doing? Very well. John, I'll just kick this off for you just so you understand. And in behind John's building, there's a, a map, a drawing that I put on the desk, and it's, it's the color one shows up just a little bit better. Um, you see where on John's property, um, somebody I think to utilize this property, um, part of that is removing part of the property, um, and then installing an underground um, propane tank there. Um, to be able to do that, they need to put the four ballards about six inches on to the town's property, the parking lot. Um, I've talked to Kevin, you know, from our perspective, it really doesn't impact anything that we do there, um, but it has to be done for safety purposes for the, the underground fuel tank. 
I think the only thing that from a staff perspective, if there was ever a point in time where the uh, underground fuel tank or underground propane tank would go away, then we would ask that the balance be removed at the same time. But it's really no impact on anything that we do. So, um, but he does need your permission, uh, the select board permission to put those ballards um, on the town property. Okay, do we have a motion about this? Yeah, so move. Second. Let's move the discussion going. Yeah, we will discuss that. Yeah, yeah. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Yes. Second by Eric. Uh, any further discussion? Go ahead, Eric. Uh, yeah, I just, I think I'm reading this right. Is this uh, the old the sports bar, the old yes. sports bar building? Yeah. Okay. Correct. It, it's this evening. How, I mean, I guess. It's not in the travel lane, no. the, the post. No. no. It, it's not in the traveling. Okay. It's right up by the building, right? Right next to it's, the building. It's, it's pretty much right up next to the building. Um, so yeah, it wouldn't affect anything. Okay. Quite honestly, when we reconfigure the parking lot, there'll be parking there anyway. So, you know, it's a matter of when we do that, but you know, the, the new configuration has overnight parking along that side anyway. So um, it, it's yeah. still not gonna impact anything that we're doing there. Okay. Is there any further discussion? Was that going to become a travel lane? No, that park was in parking on both outside. The, the, the new flow has parking on both outboard sides and then a middle lane going this way in the parking lot. Okay. So there'll be parking on that side. Oh, okay. There will be, there will be parking on will be parking parking on yeah. the side. Yeah. Perfect. All right. All in favor by roll call. Gary? Aye. Eric? Aye. Judy? Sorry, I would have to ask a question. Is this going to be for the underground tank? Yes. And as a matter of fact, speaking with Fred's Energy, they put four ballers there in case it was an above ground tank, just for your illustration purposes. But they said since it's underground, it would actually be two. And that, that's what they told me. I said, do we really need four? He says, no, that's just for an above ground, but it would be two. Um, so it definitely would be less. Thank okay. you. Aye. Aye. Brian. Aye. And I it's passed unanimously. Next, uh, road name. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank Thanks. everybody. Thanks, John. Budget. I think he can give you specifics. That okay. 
I make a motion that we approve the annual financial plan for town highways. I have a motion by Eric. Do I have a second? Second. Second, second by Gary this time. Is there any further discussion? Yes. Do you, how many miles of each do we have? Class one, two, and three. I, I, I did that. Yeah. Well, I did up the total. I think it was about 110 total. Um, it was on the highway map that we just approved not too long ago. Yeah. I have to go back and look. I want to say it's 70, 75 or 70. 75 to 80 for your class three. Yeah. Um, your class two, I think, is probably 10 to 15. Yeah. Um, your class one, I think, is four or five, and then yeah. the rest of it is class four, and there's some trails out there, too, but not a lot. Yeah, you just gave me a look. Yeah, I, you know, I just added up. It's about 110 miles total. Yeah. Thank you. Growing all the time. All right, all in favor say aye. Gary? Aye. Eric? Aye. Judy? Judy? Oh, sorry, aye. Brian? Aye. And I'm aye as well. Voters passed unanimously. Next, board appointments. Before you go there, there's a, a annual financial plan highways that has to be signed. Do we have to authorize you to sign it, Bob? We, we have it um, right here. In the, the three of us can sign it. The three of us, uh, members of the board here, that can sign it. Yeah, we can. Yeah. That's, the three of, that's a good point, though, Judy. But we can sign it. We could even have you sign it if you're going to come in later. That's right. I want to get my John Hancock on there. That's good. Or your Judy Hancock. Sounds good. Okay, next board appointment. Where does this board dance? This is uh, the, the annual appointments that you do every year after town meetings. There's a couple, um, a couple ones that are on there right now. Um, yeah, this conservation commission. Oh yeah. Actually, conservation commission. So, so we Ron and. Um, Yes, Mariah Kigi, that's it. Yeah, Mariah Kigi, uh, Ron Stancliffe, and Brent. Brent Tayon? Yes. Okay, do we want to do them all as presented or do you want to do them separately? Who wants to try it? Eric, do you want to do these one board at a time? You can do it either way, any way that the board wants. You can you can list it, and then we'll approve them all at once, as long as you mention all of them. Sure. Before we do that, Bob. Yeah. I don't believe Charles Cooley's term is up yet. He's still got another year. You're you're right. Yep. Okay. So we don't have to mention that one. Thank you, Brian. All right. So I move that we appoint. Uh, the following three individuals to the Conservation Commission, Mariah Keegee, Ron Stancliffe, Brent Tayon. Uh, along of the uh, Development Review Board, appointing Chris Wiltshire and Paul Trudell. Appointing as our Emergency Management Coordinator, Dan Lindley. Uh, appointing as our E911 Coordinator, Abby Patch. Uh, appointing Animal Control Officer, Brian Kellogg. Uh, the pound keeper position would be Brian Kellogg and Jeff Foss. Appointing the Green Ebb Day coordinator to be the Conservation Commission and Ron Stancliffe. The fence viewer, Dwayne Sprague. And for the agent to convey real estate for cemetery lots, Mark Faith and Dennis Smith. Okay, I have a motion from Eric. Is there a second? Second. Second by Judy. Is there any further discussion on that? Yes, I believe we have one more. Um, Sarah, are you still online? I uh, am. Yeah, uh, Mitzi um, would also be appointed as a trustee of public funds. Okay. I'll add that to my motion. And the terms of those appointments are listed on our sheet here. I did not read those off, but they're as printed. Okay. As presented? Yes. Yeah. Right, public funds is three year. I think 
the rest are probably one. Uh, Activation is four. Okay. DRB is uh, three. Solid waste is two year, but that's already serving. The rest are one, except for, yeah, the trustee of public funds is three. Okay, is there any further discussion? All in favor? Was there, was there a comment there? All in favor by roll call, Gary? Aye. Eric? Aye. Judy? Aye. Brian? Aye. And I'm aye as well, vote is unanimous. Motion is passed. Next on the agenda, are there old business? Any old business? Seeing none, hearing none. Approve the warrant. A motion to approve the warrants. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the warrants. Is there any further discussion? All in favor by roll call. Gary? Aye. Eric? Aye. Judy? Aye. Brian? Aye. And I'm aye. Motion is passed unanimously. Next on the agenda, TA report. Dan? Um, last week, we um, did get an approval on the, the housing storm for FEMA. I think it was for $89,000. They're going to be giving us about $84,000. That's the FEMA course. That would be the, the last section of roads. So we had two sections of roads go through. So the only outstanding one left right now is the Muncie Loop culvert. I think we've given them everything um, that we need to prove that we have to follow and apply for state federal permits. Um, but there was still some questions on road standards, and I've explained to them probably a dozen times now that the town doesn't have any any codes and standards. Mm -hmm. um, but unless, no matter what our codes and standards, once again, we would still have to follow state and federal guidelines for that. So we haven't heard anything in a couple of weeks. I can't tell you if that's a good thing or a bad thing. You know, this has been a, a well over a year process to get to that, but we did manage to get everything completed finally. Um, Tina has done an outstanding job of getting that done. And believe me, I know it's been very frustrating to her, but she's still done a great job of getting them all the information that we have. Kevin's gone out and remarked things a couple dozen times for them, but again, we did get through the bureaucratic process and, and all that funding at the FEMA level for the roads um, is completed now. What's Sorry, what's the total amount of money that we've received back from FEMA now on the two? Let's see. Uh, we're going to get an 84000 and we just got 58 And that's just for all the roads. But that's the FEMA part, and the state part is 7.5% of that. So it's not a lot, but they're going to pay us until the one city culvert stuff is dealt with. So, yeah, I mean. And then we still have another $22,000 outstanding federal highway funds. For the stage code, or for the stagecoach road repairs, and that we have been told that that's approved. We've been told, but we still don't have a grant agreement or a contract to pay us for that. And we've been working on Tina's been working on that for eight months now. Oh yeah, it's it, terrible. It's, they still keep saying it's in contract administration, which if there's anything like Governor's Highway Safety, we'll get it. You know. So we we know that one's approved. So you know, if it's, the money's come back in. I think it probably does. Once again, with the exception of the um, but to the loop piece of that whole FEMA disaster, um, I, I'd say that makes the general fund whole again. For what the general doing. fund's been paid back. What right. now we're working on is trying to pay back the bridge reserve. There's also an administrative piece of this, which they consider a certain percentage of whatever they give you, and that's what has to be determined. But we should be getting probably somewhere in the neighborhood of twelve to fifteen thousand for administrative stuff. So if, just in the back of your head, if you would keep in mind, I would be curious when we're all done with it, what the total amount expended by our taxpayers versus what we received back from state and federal. I think the taxpayers are probably interested to see. Well, I can tell you the total out of pocket, not considering my city loop, for just the road was over $150,000. That's not our buy time or our, our machinery or any of that. That's how much. Out of our, out of our so, yeah. so, but anyway, I mean, you know, once again, Tina and Kevin have done a great job keeping on top of it and keeping it moving. Um, no matter what kind of roadblocks that FEMA has thrown up, and it really has been some roadblocks, I feel, 
you know, it's a very, very bureaucratic process. And once again, it's not like we, we've been through this before um, um, a couple of different times, but this one has been kind of a nightmare to get through. So um, she was here kind of with the choir to get through this one. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah. The short timer can pick on you now, geez. I know, I know. You guys have to worry about getting <laughs> um, I'd like to, for everybody to welcome Sarah Hyde. She's the new administrative assistant to, to myself and the yeah. support. Um, she's been here a week now. Um, so far, she's doing great. We're happy to have her here. Um, one thing that did happen after post kind of town meeting um, was that we found um, that the a member of the select board cannot be first constable. <laughs> um, so Eric has declined that election. Um, now the select board has been notified. I will post a notice of vacancy. And we will look for another first constable um, to, to fill the position. So once I have all that done, <laughs> um, we'll, we'll make the appointment. So I'll come, we'll come back with whoever wants to be appointed to that position. But isn't the first constable um, technically they they can arrest the chief of police if if the chief of police goes rogue or corrupt or something? Wasn't that one of the old things? Back in the day. Gary Menashe told me that years ago. I didn't know if that's, yeah. but so we won't. We don't want the chief of police to be the first constable, really. I've, I've done it a number of years. Have you? Uh, Not that we're worried about you. Yeah. Basically, the ballot box of town meeting is the only thing I've ever been. Sure. Right. I don't know how long ago I gave it up, but maybe I did. About well, 14 years ago, chief. Was it time? Yeah, I've been here for a while. <laughs> I found an old. Well, I, yeah. I found meeting, an old appointment sheet. I'm just saying, maybe we should have like Jason, you know, Garth is second one or whatever. Well, you got to be arrested. Oh, you got to be arrested. Yeah. Okay. That's all I have. Any questions for Dan? I have a question. I probably should should have gone back to the warrants, and that was, um, I was curious. Our town clerk's office puts in a great deal of time and effort when we have these elections, especially when we have to set up at the VFW. Is there any type of, um, I don't wanna use the word compensation, but that's the only word I can think of. Just to show our appreciation, do we have any um, discretionary funds? It's really don't have a discretionary fund per se. Are you going to make cookies, Judy? I mean, they, they are compensated and paid for all of their time, and if it's overtime, it's an overtime rate. But other than that, that's pretty much what's been done. Did you hear that, Judy? I did. I was just thinking of, you know, the room upstairs could be set up very nice, have a massage therapist come in and the day <laughs> after. Uh, I want to start helping at these elections then. <laughs> I approve. I approve. <laughs> Uh, thanks, thanks, Judy. Any other questions for Dan? We'll move to select board concerns, and I'm going to ask Judy first. Thank. I I wanted to um, make a statement, and I'd like my statement to be reflected in the minutes, and I can drop my um, statement off to Sarah, and she can include them in the minutes. I am extremely disappointed that the Morristown Development Review Board may force the Lamoille Housing Partnership to spend nearly $50,000 to include a business space on the first floor of their affordable housing unit on Hutchins Street. The DRB demand occurred when the LHP requested an extension on their building permit. This decision by the DRB will also deny the LHP to use $35,000 to upgrade the municipal parking lot. The money that pays for this project does not come from our taxpayers, but it comes from a tax credit investments from businesses such as banks and retirement funds. A year ago, the DRB waived its requirement of having a business on the first floor of this building on a one block long street. COVID interrupted LHP from beginning this project. Now it seems that the Hutchins Street project is being punished because the building was not started when planned. The current vac vacant property brings in a little over $1,400 in tax revenue. The completed apartment building will bring in over $11,000 in tax revenue. The people who, who will occupy these apartments are already here in our community. Some of them are the full-time working poor. Some are trying to live on Social Security, and some are just a one emergency away from homelessness. Most of the people who need these apartments 
do not even own a car and will walk or use public transportation. Rules without exception sow seeds of tyranny. Please grant the waiver. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. <clears throat> Next, Brian. I have no concerns. I would like to thank everybody that voted for me. Um, applaud them. Also, at the same time, I'd like to say to the people who posted a lot of stuff on Front Porch Forum that our meetings are open to the public. I would myself would glad to hear from anybody that has any ideas. Um, I'm not doing these ideas all for me. I am doing them for the town. I try to do things to better the town. So thanks again, and uh, I'd glad to hear from anybody. Thanks, Brian. Gary. Uh, I think I'll respond to Judy privately. Uh, that's a DRB decision. But um, my only other concern was, uh, and that's been brought to light earlier this evening, was the ATV issue. And I just wanted to remind everybody that nothing is going to take place until such time as the governor opens it up so we can have a public meeting and so everybody can uh, voice their opinions and this has been said earlier in the evening but uh, it's uh and again i i don't know where all the uproars come from because we don't have totally yet to open any roads i mean it's been mentioned and the chair has apparently had a personal email requesting some roads, and, but as far as anything official, uh, none of the rest of the board knows anything about it. So that's it. that's the only issue I had, and I will uh, I will talk to you later, Judy, when you arrive for the rest of the meeting uh, about the DRB decision if you are so inclined. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. Eric, uh, I just want to put a plug in for my highway department. Uh, we may not have had significant snowstorms, however, that does not keep them at home with their families uh, always. The winds that we've had, the variations in temperature uh, have caused uh, them to be out in the early morning hours when we're all sleeping and getting our rest. So my thanks to uh, our highway department, both the village and, uh, and the town highway crews, uh, and to Kevin. Um, as our superintendent, I have not had one complaint given to me this year. Uh, I've not heard of a complaint uh, directly about our road conditions. And uh, it, it, it's often a challenging year, whether there's large snowstorms or not. And this has not been an exception. OK. And I, I, had, a, I had a few things. I just wanted to welcome Sarah also. Um, first meeting how do you like it so far <laughs> uh, so yeah welcome uh, the other thing is I actually wanted to um, say something for the highway too I uh, got up I can't remember if it was Monday no I'm trying to think it's Thursday <laughs> days run together I had a tree across the road right by my house at three in the morning and so I called dispatch it was a big tree not one you could drive over or go around and um, they told me oh highway's already out and I'm thinking wow they were already dealing with roads and grading and everything. And, and so I texted Kevin and, and they were already on their way. And he like, in no time they came and dealt with it. Just, we have an amazing crew and infrastructure. And I just want to thank them because they're like, like Eric says, these people are unsung heroes. The stuff that they do is amazing, you know? And um, only the people that are up super early get to see some of it. You know, I don't see all of it. I see little glimpses and it's just so impressive, you know? And I just want to thank everybody. I also want to thank uh, Sarah and the whole crew for the election process. I know it was uh, a really different year, not having town meeting. I have gotten a lot of uh, calls and texts on, and even visits to my house about not being able to voice their opinions at town meeting. From that to the ATV issue to um, the real estate stuff we've done. And um, I'm just really proud of our board. I'm glad the way things are going right now. And I wanted to thank uh, everybody that voted for me as well. Brian said it really well. And um, I also wanted to 
welcome people to, to attend meetings. I know tonight here, I think there was uh, 22 people on at one point, and that's the most I've seen in a long time. And, um, you know, the door is open here. I know, granted, we can't all be in the same room at the same time, and, and trying to do it virtually is challenging. But um, I just want to put it out there that our board is never doing anything secretly. I know I've said it before. I've said it on, on uh, social media platforms. We've never made decisions secretly. We always meet people, anyone that wants to call us or talk to us about anything, we're happy to hear it. We're happy to hear feedback. Doesn't matter if they're complaining about something or congratulating us. We want to hear it. We want to have it. I want to have it so anybody can voice their opinions no matter what it is. And um, I think that's the whole process. That's the point of it. And I'm looking forward to having a, a big, bigger meeting about the ATV thing. Um, but that, that's all I had. I. Uh, I'm just proud of our board. I think we all do a good job. I think our, our department heads do too. So that's all I have. Is there any other business? We have it. Yeah. Um, this is Sarah. I just wanted to um, thank the BCA for all their help during the elections the past year and thank, we've had a number of residents in the town that have reached out and volunteered more than ever in the past they've been wonderful people that have came and volunteered at the general election and really enjoyed it and then they came um, back and helped again at town meeting so i just want to publicly thank everybody and then i did have some statistics i emailed it around um to the board just um it, in case i i like numbers i like statistics if you are interested in past participants and uh, just to see voter turnout has been incredible in the past year. And it's it's really great to see that so many people in town are voting. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Is there any other business? I make a motion to enter executive session to discuss appointment or employment or evaluation of a public officer or employee to the body who will clearly place the town a substantial disadvantage pursuant to Title I VSA Section 313. Section four of the Vermont statutes. So good, Dan Lindley. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye by roll call. Gary? Aye. Eric? Aye. Brian? Oh, and Judy? And Judy. Judy's on her way here. I might as well. Motion is passed. Okay. Just, just please help Bob for the public that may be listening. There won't be any decisions made after. The yes, there. Just so everybody knows, there will not be any decisions made after the executive session. Thank you, everyone, for your time tonight. Thank you.